bump is just so cute, as are the Poddington Peas, and they're on tomorrow morning at 7.30 on Children's BBC. George Jetson will be coming soon after Steve, Sophie, and of course, Joe Corner. <laughs> Here. <laughs> yeah, because I've got this letter here saying, why do we laugh when we're tickled and cry when we hurt? But you haven't put your name and address on it. So, Sophie, I'm blaming you. <laughs> Sophie, I'm only joking. <laughs> now, laughing and crying are responses to things that we feel and see, like um, a good joke or a funny story or... um. Even being tickled. Or a grazed knee, or, or a sad book, or, or when somebody's horrible to you. <laughs> now, our bodies are stimulated by these emotions, and we start breathing deeply and <laughs> laughing. Oh, uh, crying. Oh. <laughs> Now, nobody knows exactly why we cry in response to pain or to sadness, but what happens is the tear duct in the corner of our eyes overflows. Well, normally it produces just enough salty liquid to wash our eyes when we blink. Now, it's impossible to tickle yourself and make yourself laugh, but you can tell yourself a joke which you already know the answer of and can't stop laughing, stop it! Sophie! <laughs> Come over here! I've got some nice jokes that'll make you laugh. We can't have people crying on corners, can we? Oh, Joe, I was only acting, you know. Acting? <laughs> yeah. Oh, well done. Have a look at these anyway. Where does Tarzan get his claws from? Don't, Don't know. know. A jungle sale. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> Wait, are your omelette good? I don't think so. I've just seen the chef beating one. <laughs> oh. <laughs> What's brown? Has a hump and lives at the North Pole. Don't, don't know. know. A lost camel. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's terrible. Joe, I've got a great one for you. Oh, go ahead. What is green and complains a lot? Don't know. Apple grumble. <laughs> 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 to be laughing you're supposed to be scared very scared because this is me yeti costume and i'm wearing it because jonathan paul marchant from hull has written in saying is there such a thing as an abominable snowman or yeti well there's been lots of stories of people that have glimpsed this strange hairy man-like creature wandering around mountain ranges like the himalayas in asia and various mountains in russia and america now, the name Abominable Snowman comes from the Nepalese translation of the word Mech Kang Mi. And in America, he's known as the Bigfoot because of the big feet marks he's supposed to leave in the snow. Now, this is a picture, supposedly, of a Yeti footprint. Now, it's difficult to tell what size it is, but that's an ice pick, and they're quite big. So, as you can see, the foot would be a lot wider and a lot longer than a human foot. And this photo here is supposed to be the trail of a yeti as it walks across the snow. And you could tell from its footprints that it walks on two legs, like us. Now, nobody's ever found a yeti, and people say that anyone that's seen one probably saw a large bear or just imagined it. And there's one theory that the yeti could be a rare primitive form of animal. Now, we've got some film here shot by Roger Patterson in California in 1967 of the yeti. Now, it's a bit wobbly at first, as he's trying to catch up with it, but as it settles down, can you see that hairy creature wandering off into the forest? And these are supposed to be the footprints that he left behind. <laughs> well, was that a yeti or what? Because to me, it looked like a man in a furry suit a bit like this one. So, are all these films and photos of yetis fakes? Does he really exist? Well, we still don't know. But there is one thing I can tell you. They haven't found a Yeti in Britain yet, so I think we're still quite safe. Now, here are some footprints well worth some closer investigation. <laughs> <laughs> 
investigating these footprints for Francesca, who's written into corners asking why do dogs make deeper marks in the sand than humans? Well, funnily enough, my special investigations have shown that dogs don't always leave deeper prints than humans. Here in the dry sand, where Sherry's been walking along beside the Eden family, the depth of all the marks is about the same. But down here in the wet sand, where the dog has been running about, Sherry's footprints are deeper and they're a bit jumbled as well. One of the clues to the answer lies in the size and shape of a dog's paws compared to our feet. Although I'm a lot heavier than Sherry, my weight is spread over a larger area because I've got much bigger feet. So, I don't sink so far into the sand. Sherry has only small feet, so that her weight is concentrated in a smaller area, especially as she was running around here. When dogs run, they only put one paw on the ground at a time. So that one paw comes down with quite some force. So what's the explanation for the same depth of prints up in the drier sand? Well, up there, Sherry was only walking about. And when dogs walk, they have two paws on the ground. And as those two paws share the dog's weight, they don't sink quite so far. But it's not just dogs who play about on the beach. Look what happens to our footprints when we go silly on the seashore! Ah. Woo. Come on! Come on, Sherry! Woo. She's going after my shoelaces. <laughs> What's this in the mystery corner? Well, it looks like a dirty great black hole to me. You're absolutely right, Steve. And it's here to answer a question we've had from Daniel Platt from Fife in Scotland. And he wants to know about black holes. Well, I'm sure he means the ones that you find in space, not the ones you can get in the middle of a studio. <laughs> yes, Steve, but there is one important reason why we can't get a real black hole into the mystery corner, isn't there? Um... <laughs> well, let's get on with the explanation, and um, I think you should start, Steve. Right. Well, it's all to do with gravity, you see, and gravity is the force that pulls everything down to Earth. And stops us falling off while the world's turning. So if you drop those letters, they fall down to the ground. That's because the Earth has a certain gravity, so that Sophie can pick them back up again. But, of course, really heavy things, like, for example, a lorry or a building, a human can't pick up. Now, each planet has its own gravity. Some are weaker than the Earth's. Like the Moon, where astronauts walk like this because there's less gravity to pull their feet back down to the Moon's surface. And planets like Jupiter have a much stronger gravity. So, so strong, in fact, you probably couldn't lift your feet at all. Now, scientists reckon that a black hole is a point where a star has collapsed and its gravity is so strong that it's pulling everything into it and nothing can escape. Nothing! No, nothing. So strong, in fact, that neither light nor sound can escape. And because no light can escape from it, all you see is a black hole. <laughs> dragged into a big black hole. Oh, my goodness. I'm going to have to do the programme all on my own now. And I've got all these questions to answer. Hang on a minute. This could work out rather well for me, actually, couldn't it? Yes, I can just see it now. Corners starring just Joe. Yes, if you have any questions for me to answer, or any jokes you want me to tell, then send them to this address. Oh, no. You've come back. Oh, thanks a bunch, Joe. But, but I thought nothing came back from a big black hole. Well, it wasn't a real black hole, Joe. It was just a television trick. <laughs> and now I think we'd better get on with the programme. But I wanted to do all these questions all on my own. Oh, all right then, Joe. Why didn't you do this one from David Summers? Why is Sherbet so fizzy? Oh, Sherbet. Oh, yes. Lovely stuff. Very fizzy. No, no, um... you can't evade the question, Joe. If you want to do the programme, why is Sherbet so fizzy? Right, fine, Sherbet. <coughs> um, yes, 
Well, since Sophie's done all that research on this particular question, Sophie, over to you. Oh, thanks, Joe. How very kind of you. Well, David, sherbet is made up of four basic ingredients. There's sugar, there's lemon flavouring to make it taste nice, and then there's two important fizzing ingredients, bicarbonate of soda and citric acid. Oh, and I nearly forgot one more important thing. My tongue. Well, it doesn't have to be my tongue. What's important is the saliva that's on my tongue, because saliva contains water. And with this jug of water, I can show you what happens when you put sherbet in your mouth. Wow! The citric acid mixes with the uh, bicarbonate of soda and releases carbon dioxide gas, or fizz, which is really hundreds and hundreds of tiny explosions of gas escaping through the mixture. And the tingling feeling that you feel when you put sherbet on your tongue is actually the impact of all those tiny little explosions. You're very dry. Otherwise, it can start fizzing before it even gets to your mouth. So, into your dry bowl, with your dry spoon, you want to put one and a half teaspoons of bicarbonate of soda. And you can buy that to chemists. And then two teaspoons of citric acid and you can get that from winemaking departments or shops. Now to that add six teaspoons of caster sugar and finally for the lemon flavouring which remember it mustn't be a fluid I'm going to use four teaspoons of instant lemon mousse mix. Now you've probably got the sugar at home but if you have to buy all the other ingredients it'll probably cost you about £1.50 and that makes an awful lot of sherbet. Now mix all those ingredients together very thoroughly and then, with a stick of licorice, or a lolly, I think I'll use a lolly, transfer the sherbet to your mouth and wait for the fizz. Mmm! Oh, that's delicious. Now, if you'd like the recipe for our Corners sherbet, then why don't you write in for a Corners fact sheet? And Steve will give you the address in a minute, once I've eaten all these sherbet. Mmm! Mmm! Save some for me, Soph! Because I'm going to be at the old computer here, because Jason and Thomas Eames have written in saying, why is there a village called Essendeen? Well, let's have a look there. Essendeen. Because they said they were looking at an old village map of Rutland, and it used to be called Essendeen. Essendeen. Oh, yes. Now, a lot of places' names change the way they've been spelt or pronounced over the years. That's partly how language changes to keep up with the times. And also, up to the last century, a lot of people didn't have dictionaries, so they didn't know the right way to spell things. So they just used to write them out the best way they thought they should. So, let's have a look, shall we? Essa. That comes from a man's name. And Dean, well, that's a valley. So... You put them together, you got Essendeen or Essendeen. So, if you want to know the name of your village or town, or you've got some jokes or questions, or you want one of our brilliant Corners fact sheets, write to Corners, BBC TV, Wood Lane, London, W12, 7RJ. Oh, sorry. I've got a really scary M puzzle this week. Two yetis scare two mountaineers, but there are six slight differences between the two scenes, and you've got 30 seconds to try and spot them, starting from now. Did you get them? They were the mountain peak, the bobble on the hat, the rope, the different coloured sock, the yeti's teeth and those mysterious footprints. Bye! Bye. <laughs> Corners, BBC TV, London, W127RJ. Great, I can make my own shirt here in the broom cupboard. Brilliant. Now, don't forget, record breakers after the Jetsons. <laughs>